Today is so special because uh, I'm winding up my 50 episodes of uh, Discover Your Second Act podcast. Never thought this journey would actually take me this far, but it has. And it has been such amazing people on this uh, with me, uh, you know, sharing their learnings, sharing experiences, sharing their life. And uh, it's been such an amazing, uh, what should I say? I have learned so much about my own self and my own discoveries along the way. So this one, of course, is the most special. I'm winding up with the 50th with a person who doesn't need an introduction, to be honest, um, but uh, still for the benefit of everyone and to make Ankur feel good. Let's just welcome Ankur Variku, uh, entrepreneur, teacher, content creator, mentor. I don't know what all. I think there is a lot more to fill here. He's been an internet entrepreneur. Uh, you know, we will know more about that based out of India is, and is one of the most top public speakers. Of course, we see him all around us. He's also a mentor to first-time entrepreneurs and conducts digital courses on entrepreneurship, career, and personal growth. He does a lot for the youth of this country. He really spends time with the startups like me. So thank you, Ankur. You founded nearby.com. Of course, we can talk about that a little bit later. You also um, are making yourself as a brand now. So um, coming to, of course, that, which is going to be the most important topic. Um, how is this journey from starting up your own enterprises to making yourself a brand? So welcome to Second Act Podcast, Ankur, and the 50th, the special one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Archana. Thanks for having me and congratulations to 50 episodes. It's no mean feat. As a fellow content creator, I know the commitment and the consistency that is required for someone to even get to this point, especially if you're doing it with guests. I, I run my podcast completely in my own control where it's a monologue and I, I, I frankly don't even know how many people listen to it except me. But uh, you, you're doing the far harder work of, of going through organizing so many individuals who are, who are now living a second act and are getting to uh, hopefully find joy in it. So it's a privilege to be on this. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my privilege indeed. So coming to the first question that I did ask right now is that what is this journey from actually being a startup yourself and now actually coming on the other side to mentor the startups and to be really a guiding factor. I, uh, the good thing, Archana, is I've, I've in some way and some shape and form have, have tried to help as many people as I could along the way. So it isn't something that I've picked up right now. It's, it's something that I have uh, come to know of me for the longest time I've known myself. Even in school, uh, if, I, uh, if I found me clearer on some concept and, and found some friend of mine struggling, I would just not give away any opportunity to, to guide them and to help them. Uh, same with college, same with work, uh, and it continued, and especially more so with, with entrepreneurship because it looks so sexy from the outside and it looks like it's, it's all a very clinical process like machinery where you uh, input money and you input an idea and out comes wealth and out comes customer love and out comes investor value creation and all those things. Uh, but it's nearly not. It's nearly not. And I learned it the hard way and I figured that it wasn't actively even spoken of. It wasn't actively shared, especially the struggles and the failures that one goes through. And I had my own share of it. Uh, and and it, it shaped me up so meaningfully that I felt uh, I, I ought to share it with as many people as I can. Um, and I stand by this because I feel that the best form of learning is actually teaching. Because if you teach something, then you go through that in your own head in a structured manner. And especially if you teach in a manner that people find it useful, and then you would have definitely simplified what was complex in your head or wasn't simple as necessarily. Um, so the transition has, has not been dramatic one day, just shift to it. Uh, it has been in the works for as long as I know myself. And, and I'm so happy that I'm playing this role right now. Wow, beautiful. And when I just open your brand website, you as a brand, it says awareness is everything. So where, where is that strong, um, 
you know, I think, is it your learning which you have put there? Is that your strongest learning? How did you coin that? And why is it in the center of everything? It is, uh, it is a realization and it stemmed from this very frequently asked question, Archana, which is what would you tell your 20 year old self? And whenever someone asked me this question, I'd be like, I don't even know because there's so much that I went through in the last 20 years. I'm, I'm 41. So there's so much that I've gone through in the last 21 years that it, it, it's impossible for me to give anything to that 20 year old uncle that would in some way help him. But when I did force myself to think about this question objectively, I realized that the only piece of advice that I would want to give to the 20 year old uncle, or for that matter, any 20 year old right now, or for that matter, 15 year old or any age, is that try and get yourself into a point in life where you're making choices from a point of awareness and not ignorance. What I mean by that is, I realized that I made a lot of choices in life out of sheer ignorance. I got a certain grade in class 10th and that grade told me that I should take up science. So I shook up science. I had no understanding about commerce. I had no understanding about humanities. Is Screw everything else. I didn't even know what science meant. I knew what physics and chemistry meant because that's what I had done, but I had no idea what computer science is. I had no idea what mechanical drawing is. I had no idea what would come of it. I had no idea what careers would take up. Uh, I took up a college and then I took up a job. And more often than not, most of these choices were just from a point of awareness. And it just so happens that I lucked out and those choices worked for me. But I can totally imagine myself not to be existent at all, not to ever feature on any Archana Dutta's podcast, forget the most special <laughs> 50th one, because I would be a nobody if any one of those choices didn't work out for me. They were choices made out of ill knowledge. They were choices that were made out of incomplete knowledge. They were choices that were made from the assumption that I had all the knowledge, none of which was true. And so I realized that the best gift that I can give anyone, including myself, is whenever I make a choice in life or a decision in life, I make that from a point of awareness. And that means I am aware of the choices in front of me. And that is why I am making the choice that I'm making. As against, I don't know of any other choice. This is what I have to make. This seems like the only choice available to me. Let's just make it and see what happens. So you not only like speak to the youth of, you know, the modern, what should I say, metro cities, but you also spend a lot of time with tier two, tier three city uh, kids as well. While the kids of the modern cities and, you know, where the infrastructure and, uh, you know, whatever they have right now drives them to some kind of awareness, they're so focused these days, so this I want to do and this I don't want to do. What about still the kids who don't have this with them? What is your advice then to them? How do they bring this awareness? Because we are still driven by, you know, either our peers or our parents' pressures or like, you know, engineer he bano and you know you have to go out and whatever so what is your advice to them how do you turn their mindset to into a direction of choosing so the role that i play archana is not that of getting people to do something my role is ironically part of the same equation that i'm trying to spread and that is awareness is everything and that starts from or perhaps has one component of it which is also that whatever i'm saying is not going to give you a solution to your problem. It is only going to make you aware of what you could potentially do. The hard work has to be done by you. The choice still remains yours. And if anyone in your world makes you feel that you're stuck, that is your worst enemy. And that person could be very well yourself. In fact, I feel that most people are their worst enemies because they constantly keep telling themselves, I'm stuck. I can't do anything. I have a job that I hate but I can't leave the job because I have financial responsibilities. I'm stuck. I can't do anything. And with all the awareness of my privilege that I have and the family that I was born into, which gave me food, shelter, bringing love, education, and values, uh, I do think that everyone in the world does have a choice to make. Sure. No one's really stuck. So... I don't have any piece of advice to anyone who feels they're stuck because frankly, none of what I say matters until they don't feel that they are not stuck. And, and from that measure, um, all that I'm doing is making them realize we're living in a world that the world has never seen before. Our parents 
you and I, we come from a very different generation where we still had limited choices. And even if we had those choices, there were material impact on our survival quotients if we were to take those risky choices and they didn't pan out. Like we could literally not have a life at all or we could just die if our parents were like, hey, let me try and become, a, I don't know, a singer, a writer as against a, an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor, which is what gave them a stable profession. Today, there are legitimate thousands and millions of opportunities that you can pursue when the world's so open as never before that you can, if you wish to, pick up anything that you want. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to be a long, arduous journey that you can undertake and you should, if you wish to, which could lead you to very meaningful outcomes. Sure. And uh, to all of them, I just say, just, just open up. If you're listening to me, there are hajar other people that you can listen to and you should. Uh, but if you feel that you're stuck, then it doesn't matter how many people you listen to. You'll always feel that way. Yeah, sure. And the kind of entrepreneurs that you are addressing now, is there an entrepreneur kit that you are you know, coming out with to say, these are the five things a new startup must do to even before initiating a journey of being, you know, the startup entrepreneur? I, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think the world's changed. Uh, I, I think what, what has happened is that, well, three things have happened. Number one, We've had in this country, <clears throat> not just lately, but in the last couple of decades, entrepreneurship and starting your own business emerge as a very legitimate way of building a career, building a profession. It used to be something that only a few people who dared to dream picked up, or it was a forte of those who already came from business families. But it wasn't something that a average middle class Indian who came from a salaried background could just pick up. But it changed. It changed. Yeah, if you didn't read it, then you can open the shop. Exactly. So it was just the same thing. I had to become a teacher for girls, I had to open the shop for girls, and it was just the same thing. Now, makemytrip.com, and then Flipkart, and then so many others that came along. They changed that face of what one could do. So that's number one that changed. Number two is a lot of money came into the country, which always helps because it builds the ecosystem and it also gives some sort of a cushion for people to take risk. And number three, because of everything that's happened globally and because of the fact that the world is so connected, there's an entire generation in India that is being raised on serious ambition as part of their growing up value system. It's not so much about, hey, just settle down and very quickly get into a uh, education and then a job and then a marriage and then kids and just live forever. It is more about you can dream and you can actually dream big. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are 21 and you can and 35, you can't. It could very well be any time and any aspect. And even if you don't come from the best pedigrees and so on, you can still do that because there are enough and more examples that are. And they saw that unfolding as well. So a combination of these three things I think became a very potent mix for, for people to thrive. Uh, but I think the DNA of the country has always remained the same. If you really look at it, a lot of people in the country are self-employed. They just haven't seen the scale that we are witnessing. But our parents have also been running in some way their own dukan, their own business, their own something, which just has held them and, and give them all the, all, all the life stability that they have gotten and, and they could raise their kids and their family with. Um, and the scale has, has just changed. So I, I don't think the, the problems and the, the kind of people that I'm meeting is, is any different. Uh, yes, they are a lot more risk loving. Yes, they are a lot more ambitious. Um, they feel that there is a lot more capital that will chase them if they were to do it the right way. But I feel that the DNA of the country still remains the same, which is of a very strong entrepreneurial DNA. So according to you, if there is somebody who's dreaming to be an entrepreneur, like you said, there are very few people who actually take a chance of quitting or taking another step, especially when people like me who are sitting in great corporate jobs and then they say, okay, now uh, should I really get on the other side? Who will give up these business class uh, travels and seeing the world and staying in the best suites of the world? It's a, it's a really big decision. But at the same time, uh, you know, one must try, 
So what is that point um, one, of course, that one should look at when you should transition or you, you, you there, there must be something inside you telling you that, yes, this is the right time. And secondly, if somebody really wants to do it, how, what are the right steps to go for it? I mean, really, because people have to, I think, one day leave their corporate, you know, big seats and then on the other side. So what is your suggestion to people like us? There are, there are multiple things around this that are said. One of the things that is actively spoken about, which I do not, in fact, vehemently disagree with and do not agree with at all is if you want to start up, then you have to quit your job and start up because you have to chase your passion and do it full time mm -hmm. and do it in a, in a manner that, oh my God, you, that's the only thing that you're doing. And, and I feel that that's poor advice because that disregards the, the reality of the world. And, and disregards the reality of that individual as well. They may have financial responsibilities. They may have um, whatever they have to address. And uh, I have, in my opinion, a very different advice for all of them. And it's, it's a three-step plan. Step one is, if you are in any situation that gives you financial stability, it could be a job, it could be freelancing, it could be whatever it is, it is don't quit because that gives you something which is very important and that is financial stability. Don't disregard that. Don't be dismissive of it. It is important and it is a reality of life. As long as it doesn't affect you physically and mentally, it is a beautiful thing to have because it gives you the most important thing that you need for your startup. And that is the pressure of not making money from day one. Anything that is born as fresh as new is going to go through multiple mistakes, going to go through multiple rounds of learning. And if it constantly feels the pressure of making money from day one, it most likely will choke and die. So you don't want to do that. It's true for your passion. It's true for your hobby. It's definitely true for your startup. So step one, stay in your job. Step two, you stay in a job in such a way that it doesn't become your life. So you are not going for employee of the month, quarter, year awards and all that shit. You're doing your job clinically well so that you do it with the bare minimum effort required, but the optimal effort required so that you are diligent and you are accountable for that job, but you don't necessarily go beyond that. For the simple admission that that job is not your life and you don't want to make it yours, you are working towards something else. So the thing that you're optimizing for when you're in that job is to take out as much time as you can for yourself your nights, your weekends, whatever way that you can build out a regime that ensures that you get time for yourself. And then step three, when you get that time for yourself, whatever is that time for yourself, do not waste that time because that's the most valuable asset you have. So the last thing you want to do is go and Netflix the shit out of your life that's left out of your job. The last thing you want to do is go on YouTube and go on Instagram and just while away. The last thing you want to do is just sleep it out. You have to ensure that whatever time you have left out of your job, which you ferociously chase as a end objective, you deploy it towards your startup, towards any idea that you want to pursue. And you do it knowing that you have time and an income stream. You have time on your hands because there's no pressure for you to do it right away. There is an income stream that is giving you that balance and that stability that you do need in life. And you are okay then to make mistakes and learn it the hard way. You literally go about it building in the right manner possible. This doesn't come from any theoretical bullshit. This comes from someone who's done it several times in his life and has benefited from that. I started my first startup while I was a consultant back in my Kani days right out of business school. And I remember for a year and a half, I had a day job as a consultant. And during nighttime, I was Batman trying to get my startup running again wow. or running. And I had a beautiful time and it also gave me the conviction after a year and a half that my decision to quit consulting and that fancy cushy job, take a 80% pay cut down to the bare minimum financial amount that I needed to survive was the right decision because I was convinced that what I was doing in my startup was actually the right thing for me to do. And that is how you would pursue anything. While I was a CEO of Nearby, and that was a demanding job because it was a venture-funded company. We were growing like crazy. We were always hiring. There were people to address. There were issues to address and so on. 
I made sure that right from day one, I was creating content because that was my way of sharing with everybody what is it that I am going through as a startup founder. I thought that that would be useful to people. And that is, in fact, that formed the basis of my entire content creation journey that you see today. In the absence of which I would have had to start from absolute scratch the day I left nearby and decided to figure out what I wanted to do next in life. So there have been several instances where I've done that. So my advice comes from uh, absolute personal journey and not from some random book that I've read that I think is true and fashionable to reproduce. But so many people will not take this advice. One, because they will never have the discipline to cull out as much time and devote it towards something that they should be working on. Two, they know that this will be long drawn and slow and they're just always impatient to make it work like tonight. And three, they will feel that the only way you build a startup, which is unfortunately the myth that has been circulated by the media and the world around us today, is that the only way to build a startup is to raise money from day one and build it on someone else's money. <laughs> and because of these three illusions, people are making, in my opinion, false choices. They're following for a very, very hard trap and a path that they have no idea about as yet. And once they do figure, it may be too late because they're deep into it. Um, and it may not be the right decision for them. So three-step process, remain in your job and get the financial security. Number two, cull out as much time as you can from that job towards yourself. And number three, deploy that time that you're spending and that you have gathered towards your startup. Be slow, be deliberate, do it with your own money, do it with all the mistakes that you can. And once you think that you're convinced that that's the right thing to do, that is when you quit your job. That's when you will also have the confidence that it's the right decision to make. Where were you, Uncle Variku, when I needed this advice? I did this after I quit my corporate life. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah I, I totally know from what you're saying makes complete sense. And I hope that people who are hearing us and uh, seeing us, please, this is a great advice to me while you're in your place try to just do exactly what Ankur has said, take up time for yourself, try to build something on the side and spend time uh, really logically on it. So that was so much good. Um, Ankur, you are a person who also has, uh, I don't know if it's come naturally to you, but you're a person who just has the right thing at the right time. You know, your public speaking ability, you're just kind of curating the content so beautifully. Did it like come to you naturally? Did you work on it and create something as beautiful as this what you do now? Or how was this journey? This didn't come naturally. And I, and I think it'll be, it'll be tragic if I say that uh, these things are inborn and, and you either have it or you don't. Uh, I, was, I was terrified of the stage. I had a experience uh, for the first time I think in class sixth or seventh on stage after which I swore that I will never go back on stage ever again. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's just like, it, it's not surprising when in a, in a poll conducted in, in the US, which I think would reflect or represent most of the world, when people were asked, what are you most scared of? Uh, public speaking was number one, followed by death. So it's crazy that people are scared more of speaking in front of a crowd than to actually die. Um, and, yeah. and, and that's, uh, that's just the reality. So I, I have been speaking on stage since class 11th. And that was when I wanted to work on overcoming my fear and surrenderpitiously as, as is the story of my life, everything has happened just by luck. Um, I was given a chance to be one of the hosts for the annual farewell ceremony that you have for the outgoing class of the class 12th students. And we were in class 11th at that point of time. And it was a very big deal in our school. It was one of the biggest, if not the biggest events of the year. Uh, and being a host of that was definitely something that was uh, a matter of public attention. And uh, my teacher, uh, to whom I owe a lot of who I am today, uh, she believed in me more than I believed in myself. And, and she pushed me and she said that you should definitely consider it. Uh, I didn't believe her at all. And I think she was kidding, but no, she wasn't. And, and the next thing I know is I found myself on that stage. And a lot of people said that, no, you, you, you look nervous, but you felt 
good and you felt like there is something in there and from then on i i started debating i started participating in any any occasion that i could gather for public speaking so what you see today where i am i'm comfortable with the camera i'm comfortable with storytelling i'm comfortable with just being myself i'm comfortable with the fumble remaining in the video because that's just my true identity and i don't want to become anyone else is is purely just 20 plus years of 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 working on myself and getting to that point and and that's why i keep saying that the best gift that you can give yourself is just work towards something as a habit as against a goal or a target if 20 years back i told myself hey why don't you start public speaking because one day you're going to become a content creator and have 4 million subscribers following you um, and that's what you're working towards i most likely would have been disastrous because i would have given myself that pressure onto myself from day one but i just said just have fun just just go on stage and don't miss out on any occasion for you to be speaking in front of the public because that will only make you a better communicator and let's just see where it takes you and today it's taken me far and beyond what i would have imagined and that's true for most habits in life that we we live with for for a long long time but do you think leaders must also speak effectively uh, i definitely are- feel that leadership and communication are two sides of the same coin and but there are great leaders who do great work but maybe not so great in communication so how do they come to this level um so there's this adage that we're often told about which is work on your strengths or work on your weaknesses and there is a school of thought that says hey your st- strengths are what define you and those are the things that you are ahead of when compared to others so if you work on them then that's what takes you far there is another school of thought that says work on your weaknesses because th- those are the ones that are pulling you down so if you work on them then you have a shot in succeeding i have a different point of view call it the third school of thought i feel that it's pointless to think about your strengths and your weaknesses because they are your strengths and your weaknesses and and no one cares what you have to think about is what is needed for you to be awesome at what you want to do yeah and that's it what is needed for you to be awesome at what you want to do and every role in this world has a very predefined and a very well established set of conditions that you have to fulfill to become successful i believe that as a leader one of the conditions is to have effective communication not because you want to be charismatic and you want to be elon musk and you want to be someone who just drives an entire world behind you no nothing like that it's to ensure that people when they listen to you see a very high level of confidence in what you say are able to trust you with your words and are able to put down if any of their differences that exist even though they may not dis- they may not entirely agree with what you're saying and that does take communication not communication in the form of being grand and being like a public speaker but communication to the extent that you need to get your point across to the other person not because you've said it but because they've understood it and if you want to become a leader then communication is a necessity for you to succeed it's not a choice it's not oh it's my strength so i am grateful for that oh it's my weakness i won't be able to win in it or i need to work on it you have no choice my friend but to become a good communicator if you have to become a good leader you have no choice but to have high iq uh, sorry i eq if you want to become a good leader you have no choice but the ability to hire and manage and retain a absolutely top performing team if you want to become a leader if you don't have these you're not going to become a good leader simple as that it doesn't matter what you bring to the table it frankly doesn't because almost all these leaders in varying shapes and capacities will have this not all of them have it with the same temperament so again i say this with absolute caution and respect you don't have to be the world's best public speaker to be a great communicator you could be the best listener in the world and that would still make you the best communicator you could not utter a single word Mm-hmm. in an entire meeting and that may still make you a great communicator the temperament with which you handle this quality is yours but the choice of that quality is not it's a given you take it or you don't that is not your choice that is the only way that you will succeed in that role and you better have that in the fashion that you are personally adapt to so beautiful yeah thank you that's very powerful indeed and i think 
young leaders, leaders of today and leaders of tomorrow, everybody has to hear this because like you said, communication is all about maybe just sitting in silence, but just emitting that energy. So it's so great. You also talk about managing emotions as a founder, um, you know, and what do you exactly mean by that? I... I've come to realize that almost all of life boils down to just one thing, interpersonal relationships. And that starts with the relationship you have with your own self. And then it extends to relationships that you have with others, relationships that you did not get to choose, your right. family, and relationship that you got to choose, which is your friends, your colleagues, your partners, and so on. I feel that people who are very well aware of their emotions are the ones that are able to do a good job of these interpersonal relationships. And the reason why that is, is because very often we think that as a human being, our job is to emote. But what we don't realize is if those emotions are happening involuntarily, where you don't even recognize when they come and you have no understanding of why they came and you have no way of then separating the emotion from the instance and the context, you will be a slave to those emotions. And that will just make you growingly poor at your interpersonal relationships. Again, starting with your own self. There's so many people who are their worst enemies, as I said. They would speak to themselves the way that they would never ever speak to even their worst enemies. They would kill themselves. They will abuse themselves. They will shout at themselves. They'll hate themselves. They'll scold themselves. They'll make themselves feel like a failure. And all of that is largely because they don't have a great understanding of why they're feeling what they're feeling when they do feel something in a specific context. And um, I didn't have that awareness either, frankly. It's not that I was born with this intelligence. I was, I was made to be aware of it uh, through a series of events that happened. And I have now come to realize after, after meditating for five plus years, uh, that meditation is a great, great, great form of you recognizing what you're feeling and why you're feeling what you're feeling. And, uh, and it boils down to this magic thing that happens, which only if you meditate, you will recognize. Otherwise, it will frankly sound like garbage. It will sound so stupid that you'll be like, this isn't true. And I totally get it because I was in that same mind frame before I started meditating. Meditation tells you that the sheer act of being aware of your emotion will make the emotion go away. The sheer act of you being aware of that emotion vividly will make that emotion go away. In other words, the minute you get angry and you recognize and you can see yourself almost as if it's an outer body experience of you getting angry and you recognize that and you're aware of it, the anger will go away. It's crazy when I say this, it sounds, it sounds like mumbo jumbo, so you wouldn't want to believe it. But that is how the human mind works. The human mind, in my understanding, is an organ that for several years has served just one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to prevent us from danger. Earlier, it was wild animals and people of our same tribe towards Today, the danger is largely emotional and largely psychological, but the job has remained the same for the brain. It's like, hey, Ankur, you're in a class of 30 students. Don't ask that question. It's a dumb question, my friend. Don't ask that. Because the minute you ask that question, people will think that you're dumb. They will think that you're stupid. They'll call you names. They'll laugh at you. They'll mock you. Yeah. Don't ask that question. It's dangerous. And your brain is just asking you to stop. But the minute you recognize that the brain is doing that to you, it will go away. Because the brain will be like, oh, you seem to know why I've come. <laughs> so that's okay. Cool. Great. I am uh, going to go back to the things that I was doing. All the best. That's how it works. It's literally how it works. So I, sorry, I, I, I tend to give really long answers, but... To your question, <laughs> I, I do believe that someone who's able to manage their emotions, not in terms of stopping them, not in terms of controlling them, that can never happen. It's not our choice. But being aware of them is someone who will prosper in their interpersonal relationships. And that starts with their own self. Yeah. 
I'm listening very carefully and I'm trying to also embed something that you are saying because there's so much wisdom out there. I think comes from not only the learnings that you've got in life, but uh, the kind of awareness that you've created. While you talk about meditation and, uh, you know, I'm a person who totally believes in it. Um, but of course, I'm surrounded also with people in at my own place who are like the minute you say meditation they want to just say oh no oh my goodness I can never meditate and that includes my husband that includes my children there's oh you just keep that gun to yourself and I think this meditation is such a warped word or such a warped emotion that um, I don't know how to bring especially the younger generation to say hey it's not sitting down and just like you know uh, being quiet and in silence and like looking at something uh, you know uh, without distraction so what do you tell at least, you know, people of um, whom you are dealing with, what is meditation for you and how to bring that in life? I, I, again, my job is not to prescribe. And I think that that's a poor job of anybody who chooses to do so. My job is to make people aware and give them the choices and then let them make those choices. I cannot make them for them. And I would not even want to push them in that sense. So all that I will do is, here's how meditation works. Here's how it's helpful. <laughs> I think you should consider it. Mm -hmm. And then I know that only 1% will. And that's the beauty of it because maybe beauty is not the right word, but I'll use that nonetheless. It's the beauty of it because none of what I tell or for that matter is written in a book or is prescribed in a self-help motivational speech or is even passed on to us by our parents or our well-wishers. None of that is rocket science and something we didn't know. None of it. I don't think the world is in a, no, not the world. I don't think people are in not so great a position in life because they don't know what to do. Mm. It's just because they're scared to do it. It's only because they think it's too easy a solution to what they think is a complex problem. And everyone's looking for a complex problem. And it's like, oh, there must be some magic wand that sets the successful people apart from the not so successful. No, there isn't. There frankly isn't. The, the pro is just the amateur who showed up every day. That's it. Just show up every day. Just face whatever is it that's hitting you. And you will very quickly become the pro because there will be no choice for you to dodge that, you will have to face it one day. And the day you face it, you will only realize something about yourself that you didn't even know you were capable of. And that journey just builds you, builds you, builds you until you become a pro. So I don't have any prescription and, and I often stay away from it, which is why I, I don't even know what it is to become a mentor or a coach or a guide or all those fancy things. Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher and the job of a teacher is not to teach people how to do but to teach people how to think. And, and that's what at least I would subscribe to. Very nice, very nice. Very well curated answer. That's Uncle Variku for you. <laughs> Uncle, uh, tell me, I'm struggling with one thing of like, how do you retain the younger talent? Um, there, uh, there are a lot of startups like me, of course, and uh, more and more are emerging every day. A lot of young people join. But not everybody is able to stick with you. So what do you tell people who are just in this journey or even uh, established corporates? How do you really retain younger people, younger talent, or even uh, colleagues who have been there uh, who are in this life cycle with you? Uh, well, two things have helped me in my understanding and my experience. One is the, the honest realization that no person is indispensable. And that includes me, starts with me, frankly. I, uh, I've never given any person, including myself, any importance more than what they deserve or they ought to have. And that has also been very clearly communicated to them, not with any form of disrespect, but in the form of saying that, look, my job as a founder or as a leader is to create a system where the system is far greater than the sum of its parts. And that means no individual has any greater jurisdiction over this system than the system itself over itself. And that's my first and foremost job. Any organization, 
that makes a individual or a role or a process or a system so powerful that it can bring the entire system down is actually failing in its role because that's not their job. So that's number one. Number two is I also then start, and, and this is something that has been absolutely my first principle always in all the startups that I've built. I do not think of people as data points on an Excel sheet. I think of people as people. And that is really, really hard because as the organization scales, this approach makes it harder for you to manage people, not easier. So surprisingly, as organizations scale, more and more people expect it to become easier to manage people because now they can become part of an Excel sheet where you're just taking mass decisions for some people. And you'll just put in things that you don't even have to think about. Like, okay, an attendance policy from now on, a holiday policy from now on, a reimbursement policy from now on, uh, this policy, that policy from now on. And who cares? Because now it's like hundreds and thousands of people who are getting impacted. So the voices are becoming blurred and, and they fail to reach you. Uh, I have not operated that way. I have been very, very high touch and very, very involved in the entire journey of building the startup and the institution because I genuinely believe that it's becoming easier and easier to start a company. It's becoming easier and easier to raise money. It's becoming easier and easier to have a fancy office and to have press and to have funding and to have great perks and to have great brand and whatnot. But it's harder if not the hardest thing to do ever, which is to build an institution where people love to come to work. Just love to come to work, love to come to work, not have to come to work, love to come to work. Mm -hmm. And I have only and only devoted myself towards that. Pick any startup and you speak to any employee, whether current or X, and ask them, hey, what's the one thing that defined that experience, whether it was Groupon India, whether it was nearby, whether it was previous, they would almost always say, it was a great place to work. People were nice. They were respectful. There was a high sense of ownership. People were very driven. We just felt like this was a great place to work. And we loved going to work. There was never any time when it's like, oh, shit, I have to go to work. Um, and that's the second piece, which is don't treat people like data points on an Excel sheet. Treat them like people because we are humans at the end of it. We have emotions. And third is one thing that very often a lot of people do not do is have a very real-time sense of feedback loop created in the system. Here's what's the biggest thing that differentiates the younger generation from the older one. Our generation, our parents' generation, Archana, we were very used to long feedback loops. We would do something and it was much later we would get to know of what has really happened, whether it was an exam given in school, whether it was college education, whether it was a decision of which career to choose, whether it was even choosing our, our life partner, so on. Things happened over a prolonged period of time. They took time to shape up. They were not spontaneous, least of all real time. The world's changed. Everything that the newer generation is experiencing today is happening at the speed of thought. It's happening right now. There's an emotion and a feeling that you feel. You put it on Instagram, you get instant feedback. You take a call of a college or a course or anything, people are instantly giving you feedback. You pick up a job with a certain salary, people are instantly giving you feedback. Like their data points and data points that are constantly telling them in real time whether they're going wrong, whether they're screwing up or whether this is the best thing for them. So they don't even know because they have not been raised in that world of what is to be patient to hear and get feedback. They don't know that. They haven't stood in line in Mother Dairy to get milk. They haven't waited for several years to get a telephone connection or a scooter, which is what we went through. I'm assuming you did as well. None of that happened. Like you, you literally walk in and you get the latest movie. You walk in, you get the latest book. You walk in, you get a date literally where you are in that club. So everything is happening real time. Now in that environment, if they were to work and at the end of that one year, get some random stupid appraisal process that tells them how they did on 
something that they were not even told they were being evaluated on and then becomes the prerogative of the manager, which then decides how they're going to grow in life in terms of their increment. None of that complies with their worldview. None of what I said complies with the worldview. It's like, are you living in outer space? Like what world are you living in? <laughs> how does 365 days later, a feedback come to me that tells me what I did in my third month, which screwed me over. And now is a result of me not getting promoted. Sorry. Like if you told me three months at that point itself, I would have course corrected and you would have seen a very different version of me because all along, I, I just felt that you, you kept saying good job in all your emails. So I thought I was doing a good job. And now you're sitting and reflecting upon my life for the last one year and you come to recognize I just met some expectations and not all, least of all, exceeded some. So I feel that the feedback loop needs to just close down and close down very quickly. It needs to be real time. Like that's one thing I've been working on. I've only got into a monthly feedback loop right now in all my setups. I would love for it to be hourly. Like I would love for every meeting in the organization to be part of a feedback system that as soon as the meeting is over, sends a notification to everyone saying, hey, how did everyone do in that meeting? Just tell us. You don't have to give a grade or anything. Just say, Archana, thumbs up, thumbs down. Ankur, thumbs up, thumbs up. In that meeting itself. And every meeting is documented in an organization. So I'll just use that and I will just get every meeting, meeting feedback captured that gives me a trend line over a year for every single individual with then enough and more bylines to tell me <clears throat> what is it that they're good at and not. It will keep feeding back to them. They will know what to do. If they find themselves in a place that's not working for them, they will themselves quit and you should be happy that they do. If they find themselves in a place where they're getting great feedback and they're improving, they will thrive. Yeah. And you will be surprised at how that's even happened. Yes, and I totally believe in it and uh, try to do this with my little small team, which is here so that, you know, the words of encouragement go as soon as they do something or even otherwise. Ankur, you have dreamt of, people say when you dream of the sky, you fall somewhere, uh, at least, you know, somewhere in the middle. You dreamt of NASA and uh, here you are. So... <laughs> I don't know how to frame the question, but did you fall uh, and like, you know, or are you even soaring high? So how do you want to frame that? I, I, I think the, I, I actively speak about this, Archana. Uh, very often we're told in life that the, the only way that you become successful in life is if you have a plan and you got to have a plan. If no one has a plan, no one's going to succeed. And I had a plan. I had a plan in my life that was as good as a plan can get. It was an objective plan. It was an achievable plan. It was a very well laid out plan. It was a plan that I was working on. It was a plan that I was actually doing well on. It was a plan that I was executing. Everything part of a good plan was part of my plan. And yet life punched me hard, like literally mocked me, laughed at me, told me that you think you have a plan, but I have a plan for you. And I want to see how you react to that plan. Mm -hmm. So when I dropped out of my PhD and I came back to India, I had two choices. Choice one was plan A didn't work, which was to become a PhD space scientist and then to join NASA and to do all the great things that I'd imagined myself to do. That didn't work. So plan B, plan B didn't work, plan C, plan C didn't work, plan D. That's what the world tells you. Always got to have a plan, a plan, a plan, a plan. Or two, as crazy as it sounded, was it even possible to live life without a plan, without a goal, without a target? Hmm. And if yes, then how is that life lived? Because frankly, I had no basis for me to come up with another plan. I just had my core plan of life getting destroyed in front of my eyes. And I'm so glad that I came to realize that that wasn't something that should have been my plan. But now that I did, did I have enough basis to come up with another plan? No. So I'm not going to be fooled saying, oh, this plan looks sexy. So let's just go with this plan. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to set up any fake goal or target for myself just to make me or society happy about me. But that meant that I had to live life without goals and targets. And I didn't know how to live life without goals and targets. Today, I know. And I reflect upon my life for the last 15 years when I came back from the US. And the single biggest thing that I learned now is don't set goals and targets, just set habits. Just set habits. And those habits will take you beyond the goals and targets that you could have imagined for yourself. Just set habits. Habits that compound over time that set you up for opportunities you could not have planned in any organized way for yourself. And most of those powerful habits are there in the mindset. Today, 
one of the most powerful habits that i have which i have come to think of as as natural as it is and when people see me in action they're like how does this even happen to you is it's my habit now to resist the obvious i resist the obvious so if i'm in a certain context i ask myself hey if this exact same context were to given to everyone in the world what would most people choose to do and then i resist that path i don't say i dismiss it or i say no to it because that'll be stupid i don't want to be contrary in all my life but i resist it because i have come to believe that if i take the path that most people will in their life then i'm going to end up like most people in their life it's a law of physics you can't change that yeah. so the only way that you have a shot in life to become bigger than most others is to not do what most others are doing in which case it needs to be obvious that you resist the obvious and that sounds like a really cool thing to say but when you make it part of your machinery it is like a superpower very few people can get overnight even if they had all the capability to it's like somebody it's like you are in and i'll give you an example it's you are in the top 50 of a global mnc called groupon which is a multi billion dollar setup you're in the top 50 ranks of that company loaded with esops loaded with reputation loaded with status loaded with comfort loaded with money and 90% of the world in that case would continue to be in that job or to take up another similar job and i was like if i do that then i'm going to end up like 90% of the executives i meet every day and i have the highest respect for them but i don't see myself like them so what's resisting the obvious and how many people in this world i'm not giving myself credit here but i'm sorry i'm coming across as immodest how many people in the world would actually say you know what here's something that i will do i am the owner of this i'm the manager of this business called group on india and i believe in this business day in and day out like nobody else does so i'm going to go to group on global and say i want to buy this business from you and make that into an independent entity that i will run on my own i frankly do not know of anybody else in my world that would propose that even if that thought struck them they would instantly dismiss that they're like pagal ho gaya dimag kharab ho gaya and i don't know why it's so natural for me to pursue that path it's just so natural for me to pursue that path because i know that it comes with massive amount of downside but also an infinite amount of upside it will change the game if it works and even if it want to frankly the downside is is capped even if it feels like massive downside it's all in your head it's capped like that thing doesn't work you go and get another job that's it that's the worst thing you as it is were in another job so it's not like you go really far below than what you were but the upside if it works oh my god it'll change your life it did mine and i stand here as a survivor with survivorship bias completely in it for me when i'm saying that that's a happy story that worked but the larger point i'm making is habits compound like nothing else does especially habits of the mind and if you get to that then you don't need to set any goals and targets i have not like i don't know the answer to that question where do you see yourself 5 years from now i don't know but i'm okay with that I'm totally okay with that yeah very powerful indeed um of course i am very curious to know a lot more on this topic why would you not want to be amongst those 90% where is that feeling coming from um what is it that ankur variku uh, really wants to do out there maybe but we will take it for i don't know how much time you have so i'm just going to ask you should we <laughs> wrap up yeah so yeah so what we we'll do is that we will maybe have part two of it but i want to just close with the question on second act of course because we are on a podcast of second act which is something that defines your higher purpose we have our powerful stories our struggles failures successes and there comes a direction a direction to make uh, one life impactful and purpose led so is there a second act that you're working on have you experienced many second acts or is there something you're still seeking 
I, I've had multiple acts. I was, I was growing up to be a scientist and then I dropped out to become a business school student and a consultant. I dropped off that to become an entrepreneur. I dropped out of that to become a senior executive in an MNC. I dropped out of that to become an entrepreneur again. I dropped out of that to now become a content creator. I'm certain I will drop out of becoming a content <laughs> creator sometime in the future to become someone else. I'm playing multiple acts and I genuinely believe that we've just been given one life. So it'll be a tragedy if one lives that one life with just one identity. So. My goal is when I die and people are like, hey, who, who is this guy? They just find it immensely hard to describe who I was. That's it. That's when I know that I've lived a life that I wanted to. I don't want to be, oh, he was an entrepreneur. I don't want to be, oh, he was a father. Oh, I don't want to be, oh, he was a teacher. He was a content creator. None of that. It's like, you know what? I, who knows? In the last five years, this is what he did. But who, who knows what he was doing in the last 50 years? Because he seemed to just change his entire identity every five years, every 10 years, to the extent that no one except him knew anything about him. I think that'll be a life which will make me really happy. Great. So do epic shit, Uncle Variko. <laughs> that's all over whenever we speak and, you know, at the background, uh, that's the first thing that comes up. So all the best. And uh, I'm sure that uh, what you are manifesting shall happen because you don't want to be the um, one in the crowd. You want to be different. <laughs> okay, sara, sara, and uh, all the best to you. And thank you again, really. I know that you spent more time uh, than we promised. I couldn't help it, but, but you know, your answers were long and, uh, and they were so much in the flow and they still had so much to say that I didn't have a heart to say, I don't want to know. I want to know everything and um, still- No, thank you for being patient. <laughs> thank you for being patient. So thank you so much. And this is indeed. Thank you. Everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Arshana. All the best. Thanks for having me. Bye.